It is now time for question period. The member from Nipissing. Thank you, Speaker. <clears throat> My question uh, is for the Premier. Well, Premier, you got caught red-handed again. Uh -oh. You were told about the precarious state of Ontario's finances on one day and went out the next and told the bond rating agencies the complete opposite. No. In fact, you and your finance minister told the entire legislature the complete opposite of what you knew to be the facts. And now you're trying to block the release of public documents you know that show the real you. Oh, this is not the old Liberals doing this. This is you, Premier. You preach openness and transparency, but as soon as we published public documents, you tried every trick in the book to block us. Premier, exactly what is it you don't want Ontarians to see? You see that, please? Uh, I'm beginning to hear already things that I don't like, and I'll stop it. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I know that the government House Leader is going to want to speak to the specifics of the uh, documentation that the uh, member opposite is uh, is referring to. But I, I just want to make a, a general statement, and that is that since I have been in this office, I have done everything in my power. The member from Prince Edward Hastings, come to order. To questions. Whether it's questions on from the uh, relocation of gas plants, Mr. Speaker, we opened up the process around the gas plants. We provided we provided tens of thousands of documents, Mr. Speaker, to the uh, to the committee. I've appeared before the committee twice. In terms of our uh, fiscal situation, Mr. Speaker, the information that is provided in the fall economic statement speaks to the exact situation that we are in in Ontario. We were very open about uh, about the reality. Of our Answer. situation, including the, the revenue uh, shortfall of $5 billion, Mr. Speaker. So uh, I, I hope that the member opposite has had Thank a chance you. to read the fall economic Thank statement. You. Supplementary. Thank you, uh, Speaker. Premier, your government got caught again. So out come the Liberal buzzwords. The budget was recalibrated. No one in accounting, Speaker, even knows what that means. Nonetheless, we're talking about a fixed point in time last spring. You and your cabinet were told the cold hard facts, and you turned around and told the bond agencies the complete opposite. Now they say the budget speaker will be aspirational. They aspire to have better numbers. Well, I'm sorry, Premier, the financial world doesn't want your aspirations. They want the real numbers. You're doing, you're doing everything in your powers, Premier, everything in your power to block the facts from getting out. What you continue to say one thing and do the other is opposite. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, let's talk about let's talk about some numbers because the uh, the member opposite has said that uh, he's interested the in some numbers. So let's talk about will some come reality order. here, Mr. Speaker. What we're dealing with. He will come so to order again. We exceeded our fiscal targets four years in a row, Mr. Speaker. We're the leanest government in Canada. If you look at if you look at the cost of programs, Mr. Speaker, we're the leanest government in Canada. We've created 446,000 more than 446,000 net new jobs since the recessionary low. Employment rose in Ontario by 95,700 jobs in 2013, Mr. Speaker. We've created 9,000 youth job placements through the Youth Employment Fund since the September. The member from the facts. Minister for Rural Affairs will come to order. The member from the Minister for Rural Affairs will come to order. And the advice that we have gotten from officials, Mr. Speaker, is advice that we have acted on when we Answer. released the fall economic statement. Those numbers and that advice was reflected in the fall economic statement. Thank you. Final supplementary. Thank Thank you, uh, Speaker Premier. Let's look at the secret documents you tried to have quashed today. Let's see what you didn't want the public to see. Yeah. You have a fiscal gap. Uh -oh. First, it was $3.5 billion. Oh. Two days later, you were told, quote, your plans fall short of managing within allocations, oh. quote. So you bumped up the gap to $3.6 billion with no plan on how to pay for it. Oh. Then you went to a caucus retreat to take decisive action on reducing this massive hole. Sadly, you spent a further $900 million that day, bringing the hole in your budget to $4.5 billion. That's just the extra. That does not take into account the $10.1 billion deficit and the $7.2 
$1.5 billion deficit you're already forecasting. Now, Premier, I can see why you want these documents to be kept from the public. Absolutely. What else are you hiding from us? Thank you. Premier, Governor Hall. Mr. Speaker, uh, I, I'm a little bit disappointed in the honourable member across the way. I think he would realize, above anyone, as someone who has served on a number of committees that have had access to a certain government information, that there's a balance in this legislature. And we've discussed this before in the House, Mr. Speaker, where committees have the right to information. That right is provided to them. But there are also moments the member from Oxford come to order. when there are private matters, where there are third-party uh, issues, where there are documents that uh, are of such a sensitive nature that uh, the public version of are redacted. You know, Mr. Speaker, I quote from uh, uh, 2002, the Minister of Member Energy from Oxford, today, come uh, to Mr. Order. Wilson, in regards to confidential information on a lease agreement between the Ontario Power Generation Answer. and Brit British Energy, acknowledged at that time that disclosure of financial and commercial information from Ontario Power, and I'll use his words, quote, may be prejudiced significantly. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary. I mean, a speaker. If question. New, new question. New, new question. Uh, speaker to the Premier, if anyone should be standing up bringing a point of privilege, it should be us against, against every minister who attended the cabinet retreat where it was disclosed you have a $4.5 million budget gap and a billion dollar budget gap, and then all stood in this House and told the rest of us, quote, we're on track to balance the budget. Premier, you knew what you were telling this legislature, the financial community and the public was the exact opposite from the real financial picture. And when we presented these public documents, your first reaction was to attack me personally, accuse me of releasing confidential documents, even though you know those documents were supplied by the clerk and are public documents. Last, last September, Premier, last September, you stood and said, quote, I don't believe undermining people's credibility or attempting to do that is necessary. When did you change your tactics, you. or was that always your MO? Order. Premier. Government House Leader. You know, first of all, Mr. Speaker, let me uh, let me continue the quote. 2002, the Minister of Energy, Mr. Wilson, the day in regards to confidential information on a lease agreement between the Ontario Power Generation and British Energy, acknowledged at that time that disclosure of financial and commercial information from Ontario Power, and I'll use his word, from home, come to order. prejudice significantly the competitive position of the corporation or result in undue loss of gain to parties other than the corporation. Mr. Speaker, that's just one example when they were in power of how. Uh, efforts were made to make sure that there was a balance between the committee's right to see documents and the fact of the matter that certain documents, Mr. Speaker, is, are of a sensitive nature. Those documents were provided to the committee, Mr. Speaker, but there was also an yes, urging sir. of the committee, which the committee accepted, Mr. Speaker, to hold those documents in confidence without the express uh, permission of the committee itself. Supplementary. Thank you to the Premier. Uh, I realize you're talking about 20-year-old documents, but why don't we look at a very recent one and see what you didn't want disclosed to the people of Ontario. The gravity of the situation in Ontario comes to light in a note from your financial officials. They tell you that because you haven't implemented any changes in your spending habits, you now have to cut $6.9 billion. They say, quote, changes since 2012 budget shows a deterioration in the fiscal outlook beyond 2013-14. Premier, you want to keep this information from being made public, but you can't. These are public documents that you want quashed. This tells me we've only scratched the surface. These are the ones that are already disclosed. There's something else in those files you don't want us to see. So I ask my fellow MPPs, lend us your staff to scour through these thousands of documents and discover what Kathleen Wynne does not want us to see. Order. 
Order. Order. I, uh, I will remind the member and all members again that we use titles or writings. Government House Theater. Mr. Speaker, I, I'm, I'm trying to get this clear. The Honourable Member is standing up and quoting from documents that were provided by the Minister Carleton of Finance will come to, order. to the Second committee, time. which are in the public domain, so which loud. are in the uh, possession of all the members of the uh, committee, Mr. Speaker. And he's standing here in the Legislature and saying, why do we not give him the documents? Mr. Speaker, we gave him the documents. The member from Renfrew, Nipissing, Pembroke will come to order. And the member from Oxford will come to order. Mr. Speaker, the best estimate we have is that there have been over 2.6 million documents provided to various committees by this government. And, Mr. Speaker, the fishing expeditions of the opposition have cost tens of thousands of dollars in staff time, have tied up the bureaucracy, Mr. Speaker, but we recognize their right for those documents and we have provided them. Mr. Speaker, they have the documents. Thank you. New question. Sorry. Final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Yes, we have the documents, and you're trying to stop us from releasing them. I tell you what's in another one of them. You continue to use the word, the buzzword, aspirational. Let's see what the Secretary of Cabinet told you in one of these documents. Quote: The plan to continue reducing spending beyond 2015-16 is largely aspirational in nature, rather than backed up by detailed plans and measures to get us there. So now we know what aspirational means. We love this to happen. We just have absolutely no idea how to get there. Premier, is this your idea of governing? You get caught and you attempt to drag me through the mud to distract from the fact that you have no plan for the 600,000 men and women who woke up this morning without a job. This is the latest example of the Liberals putting their priorities ahead of the needs of the people of Ontario. Thank you. Exactly, exactly, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I, 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 the member should know the Oscar season was uh, was a few weeks ago. I mean, the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, that we have provided thousands and thousands of pages of documents to that committee, Mr. Speaker. Those documents have been made public. They are available for discussion and debate here in the legislature. At the time, Mr. Speaker. That's enough. Yeah, I did. I caught you. And you can look away all you want. Mr. Speaker, at that time, the committee, of which the opposition has a majority on it, decided that certain documents, certain parts of documents which are of sensitive nature, should remain confidential unless the committee itself decided otherwise, Mr. Speaker. That was the committee's decision, Mr. Speaker. The documents that uh, uh, he has received, Mr. Speaker, that he's talking about today, Mr. Speaker, are in the public domain. The other documents that will be part of a point of privilege, Mr. Speaker, as I'm sure you would agree, will be dealt with later in today's session. Thank you. New question. Leader of the third party. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Over the last few weeks, uh, we've been putting forward positive plans to clean up the mess in our electricity system, to help small business and job creators. Yesterday, the Premier wouldn't even confirm what current government policy is when it comes to her planned tax cuts for the wealthy. Why can't the Premier answer basic questions about her fiscal plans? Premier. Oh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And I, uh, you know, I, I thank the uh, leader of the third party for the question. Uh, what I said yesterday was that we will be bringing our budget forward. There will be information obviously laid out, Mr. Speaker, about uh, how we are going to move forward uh, to, uh, to make sure that we meet the needs of the people in the province. Part of that, Mr. Speaker, is taking costs out of the electricity system. And, you know, we have a long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, that speaks to just that. It speaks to having a reliable energy uh, plan in 
in the province, Mr. Speaker, something which we have not heard come forward from the NDP. In fact, all we've heard from the NDP on energy is that they don't agree with any, uh, any, of, the, uh, any of the initiatives that we've taken. They don't agree with nuclear. They don't agree with green energy. They don't agree with any of it, Mr. Speaker. But what they would do, we have absolutely no idea. So we have a long-term energy plan. Thanks, we will be bringing the uh, budget forward, Mr. Speaker. And in the meantime, I look forward to uh, any conversation that the leader would like to have. Do supplementary. Speaker, the Liberal plan seems to be changing day by day. The party that brought us the HIST and Sky High Hydro rates is suddenly concerned about the middle class squeeze. The Premier said she had no choice Minister, but to ask the Minister of Immigration and Citizenship come to order. And fees is suddenly scrambling to back away from training colleges ideas. and universities come to order. Would the Premier agree with the following statement? Liberals have very strong principles, and if you don't like them, they can change. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I don't have the Marx Brothers response to that, Mr. Speaker, but I believe it was one of the Marx Brothers who, uh, that's a paraphrase. Mr. Speaker, we know and have known all along that the, uh, the middle class is the backbone of the economy. We know that, Mr. Speaker. That's why we put the 30 per cent off tuition brand in place, Mr. Speaker. That's why we have been working so hard to make sure that costs like electricity uh, are managed and that there are plans in place to help people and programs in place to help people deal with those costs, Mr. Speaker. So, uh, what I said last week about uh, the decisions around how we will raise revenue for uh, uh, for uh, the transit fund, Mr. Speaker, I simply took some options off the table. We will still bring forward a, a transit plan, Mr. Speaker. There will be a transparent fund that will provide for the building of transit into the future. What the leader of the third party is not saying is that she does not support and has not put forward any ideas about how we would actually build transit into the future, Mr. Speaker. We're committed to doing that. We will bring forward yes, our plan in the budget. I think it would be consistent with the history of the NDP if they actually supported the building of transit and transportation in this province, Mr. Speaker. Speaker, families feeling squeezed in tough times are looking for a government to focus on creating jobs, making life more affordable, and to respect the money that they send to Queen's Park. Instead, they see a Liberal government scrambling to distance themselves from their own policy while the same old status quo rolls on. Does the Premier really think that that's good enough, Speaker? Mr. Speaker, I really think that uh, it's, it's a bit rich for the leader of the third party to talk talk to me about distancing myself from policies when unrecognizable across the floor is anything that would resemble the NDP that I have known in the past, Mr. Speaker. So, we are, we are, committed, we are committed to making the investments that are necessary to move this province forward, Mr. Speaker. transportation system, Mr. Speaker. We know, for example, that in the north, roads and bridges are what are necessary if we're going to have solid transportation planning. That's why we have a $100 million roads and bridges fund. I'd ask the leader of the third party, does she support that if she doesn't support transit building? Thank you. Remember, for Kitchener, Waterloo, come to order. New question, Leader of the Third Party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. Uh, my next question is for the Premier, although I find it ironic this is the government that cancelled the ONTC. Uh, uh, really uh, nonetheless, New Democrats have been putting forward some achievable, affordable, concrete plans to make life better for people and Member to create from jobs. Bruce Gray on sound will come to order. tax credit is a simple way we can reward the companies that are putting people to work, not the ones that are shipping jobs away. It's working in other jurisdictions, and the Obama administration administration thinks it's going to work too. Why is the government more interested in defending the status quo than trying to create new jobs with something new? Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I am absolutely not 
in, not in favour of the status quo. And in fact, I'm very impatient about our future, Mr. Speaker, which is why I want to move on making the investments that are necessary. And I am looking for, and we are working with uh, groups of people around the province, and we are putting forward ideas that are going to make life better, including integrated transportation planning. And Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the leader of the third party neglected to mention that on the ONTC, we have put together a group. We are working to make sure that there is a plan other than clear divestiture, Mr. Speaker, and I think the leader of the third party knows that. Mr. Speaker, we, we are going to work with ideas that are feasible, but I would ask the leader of the third party what would be the cost of the credit that she's putting forward? Is it for every job in the province, Mr. Speaker? I think she hasn't Thank done you. her homework on that, Mr. Speaker. Supplementary. Well, Speaker, I'm going to try again with uh, another one of our plans. Our broken electricity system is driving up bills, and it's driving businesses out of Ontario. In fact, American cities are trying to entice Ontario businesses with cheaper electricity. And the worst part is, it's our electricity. The people of Ontario subsidize electricity's exports to the U.S., and the U.S. uses those discount prices to lure our jobs away. We've put forward a concrete plan to stop exporting hydro at a discount rate. Why is the government more interested in defending the status quo than trying something new to create jobs? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, and I, I will speak to the specifics of the energy uh, issue, but I, I just want to point out, Mr. Speaker, that as the NDP leader has done for a number of weeks now, she is pulling individual issues uh, out of the air, Mr. Speaker, we are, we are working to address the, the concerns of the people of the province of Ontario in context, Mr. Speaker, in a coherent way. So having a long-term energy plan, Mr. Speaker, is that kind of coherence. You can't just deal with issues on the one-off. Supporting business, Mr. Speaker, making sure that people have jobs, those have to have coherent plans. So, in fact, this NDP plan, which isn't a plan, it's just a uh, single initiative, Mr. Speaker, would actually drive electricity bills up. It, what the NDP wants to do is to end electricity yes, exports that save ratepayers $300 million a year. Well, we're not going to do that, Mr. Speaker, but if you want to bring forward a plan that's part of a, a broader coherent strategy, we'd be happy Thank to you. look at that. Supplementary. Speaker, people see Liberals scrambling to defend sky-high CEO salaries at bloated hydro agencies, selling discount electricity to the U.S., and sticking families with the bill, opening loopholes for CEOs that can get the HST off their entertainment expenses, and scrambling to back away from some of their own plans. What they don't see is a plan to put their priorities first and create and protect good jobs. Why is this government more interested in defending the status quo that's not working than trying something new to create jobs? Thank you, Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So, on all of those fronts, whether it's job creation, Mr. Speaker, or whether it's energy, Mr. Speaker, we are putting in place, as I said, coherent plans that have a no number of aspects to them. So, if we talk about energy, we are in our long-term energy plan. We talk about the generation of electricity over the next uh, decades, Mr. Speaker. We talk about taking costs out of the system so that, for example, we won't move ahead to build new nuclear because that's the $15 billion, Mr. Speaker, that it's not, not necessary to spend. On the job creation strategy, Mr. Speaker, we need to make investments in training and skills. We need to make investments in infrastructure, including transit and transportation, Mr. Speaker, and we need to support businesses yes, that are ready to expand or bring their business to Ontario. We have to have that kind of coherent planning. They cannot be one-offs, as the yes. NDP is proposing, Mr. Speaker. Good question. The member from the and Carleton. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker. My question is uh, for the Premier. A few moments ago, your government House leader threatened to censor or try to censor our finance critic for revealing in public documents you have, have a $4.5 billion hole in your so-called aspirational budget. That tactic, the one that you're trying to employ, closely resembles the one that Dalton McGuinty did over the two cancelled gas plants. It it's very difficult for Ontarians to trust you when you say one thing in the back rooms and another thing here in the Assembly. Premier, we want to know from you 
What's it going to take for you to come clean on the state of Ontario's economy? A third OPP investigation? You see them, please? Thank you. I, uh, regrettably, uh, the member from Renfrew and Nipissing Pembroke is warned. Yeah. You know, Mr. Speaker, it's, it's, it's disappointing, but let's, let's just go with, with the facts of what's happened here, Mr. Speaker. A committee of the legislature, as is its right, asked for documents, uh, in this case from the Ministry of Finance, they were provided. The committee itself, Mr. Speaker, as I pointed out earlier, of which the opposition is the majority, decided that certain documents that were of a confidential nature that had been identified by the Ministry of Finance should remain confidential until the committee, the committee decided. decided. Mr. Speaker, that is the issue. My understanding is that you will be hearing a point of privilege on this a little bit later, Mr. Speaker. But once again, Mr. Speaker, thousands and thousands of documents were provided to that committee as requested, the subject of discussion yes, and debate, and over two million documents, Mr. Mr. Speaker, have been provided to two committees. That, Mr. Thank Speaker, you. is the situation and the aspersions that she's put forward. Are Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, but the facts are my finance critic, Vic Fideli, has the information. He found a $4.5 billion hole. He has the documents, and you are trying to censor him. The public has these documents, and you're trying to censor a member of the opposition for exposing this government's $4.5 billion hole. It is nothing different than the 1.1 cancelled gas plants that we've seen so they could save seats. This Premier would cling to power in her office at any cost. All we are asking, Speaker, is will she come clean Order. and tell the province exactly what size of the hole her budget is, what the accounting practices are going to employ. We had a Premier last night in this nation that resigned over a $45,000 expense scandal. Question. Now she has a $4.5 billion expense scandal. Will she come clean? Thank you. Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, again, the majority on that committee, Mr. Speaker, is the opposition, the and that North committee Sunderland decided to keep certain documents confidential, and there will be a moment Many later today that. in which uh, this matter can be looked at by privilege, Mr. Speaker, but it's a little rich coming from that side of the House when they want to talk about committees and gas plants, Mr. Speaker. As my colleagues back here have uh, reminded me, Mr. Speaker, when are we going to see the Conservative candidates come forward and the committee who wants to talk about their promises during the last election to cancel the gas plants, to come forward and talk about the funding analysis that they've done, Mr. Speaker, if they want to talk about— The member from Prince Edward Hastings is warned. The Minister of Aboriginal Affairs will come to order. Mr. Speaker, if there's any party that needs to talk about hiding things before a committee, it's the PC party across the way and what's happening in front of the Justice Committee. The hiding question. The member from Timmins, James Bay. My question is to the Premier. Premier, less than two weeks ago, you stood in your government caucus room in a press conference saying that you represented change and that you were going to bring transparency and accountability to this province. So? You may not be applauding at the end of this question. The next day, what do you do is you appoint Sandra Pupatella as the chair of Hydro. Can you tell me how that is different from what has happened in the past in a cronyism that we saw from the McGuinty government before you? Premier. Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, that question has been asked on several occasions. That question has been raised. Mr. Speaker, my answer is the same. We had two chairs of two of our uh, agencies, Mr. Speaker, who had been in office for 10 years, and we decided we were going to replace two chairs. Through the environment. With respect to uh, the, uh, the chair that has been referred to by member the, uh, from Hamilton, member Stony the third Creek. party, she has served 
as a public servant for 17 years, Mr. Speaker. In this House, she has served as a minister of three or four different portfolios in government. She has tremendous credibility. She understands the system. She understands budgeting. She understands sensitivity to the public, Mr. Speaker. We could not have chosen Member from North a more candidate from North. in our position. Your party. Supplementary. Listen, this is a simple question that Liberals are appointing their friends to a political office in order to get money. Listen, if it was just Sandra Pupatella, we would say, oh well, it's a one-off. But you take a look at who you've appointed. You've appointed Michael Bryan to a very nice board with a very nice salary. You've appointed Maria Van Bommel to another board with a very nice salary. You appointed your transition team leader, uh, Madame Smith, to Washington, just to say a few. So tell us, how is the Wynn government any different than any other Liberal administration when it comes to appointing their friends to high places on the taxpayer's dime? Mr. Speaker, I'd like to throw a few names out for the members. Minister here. of Education, Let's talk about Minister Francis of Health Lincoln. Long -term Let's talk about Elmer Buchanan. Albert Buchanan. Let's talk about Joe Pantaloni. Joe Pantaloni. Let's talk about Bernard Lord, former Bernard Premier of New Brunswick, who was also appointed the same time as the chair of Hydro One, Mr. Robert Speaker. Sears we have been meticulous and being aggressive. Minister of Rural Affairs, come to order. Second time, Mr. Speaker, and we have nothing to be embarrassed about. Thank you. New question. The member from the Tobacco North. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, uh, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Civil, Civic Affairs, uh, the Honourable Michael Coteau. The number one destination in Canada for newcomers. This remains true despite representations otherwise from the party opposite. Newcomers to this province, Speaker, by and large, have the post-secondary education, the on-the-job experience, the specialized skills, and most of all, the drive to succeed in their chosen careers. Thus, the creation of our immigration strategy in 2012 and why we have prior prioritized the licensure of internationally trained professionals. In this regard, the government has introduced the Ontario Immigration Act, an important piece of legislation. My question, Speaker, is this. How will the Ontario Immigration Act, Bill 161, strengthen our efforts to ensure that highly skilled newcomers, such as physicians and engineers, can find positions in their fields? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member for the question. I'd also like to acknowledge that today is the beginning of Noruz, so anyone who's celebrating that wonderful ancient celebration, all the best. It gives me great pleasure to talk about Ontario's Immigration Act, Bill 161, and I'm encouraged by the positive feedback that I've heard in this legislature in debate. Absolutely. Mr. Speaker, this bill will do many great things for current and, uh, and, and, current and prospective newcomers yeah, here yeah. to the province of Ontario. Like the member asking the question stated, helping newcomers find the right type of job that matches their skills is a priority of this government. If Bill 161 is passed, it will amend the, health, the Regulated Health Professional Act to provide timely decision-making decision -making regarding registration application and access to records by applicants in health care professions. These measures are in line with the recommendations that came from the Fairness Commissioner back in 2013. And I'd also like to highlight that our government will continue to invest into Bridge Training Thank Program. You. We made a commitment of $63 million this year over the next few years. Supplementary. Noros Mubarak to you also, Minister, and thanks for the response of the various measures that you've outlined, which I know will be appreciated widely, but not only across Ontario, but in my own riding of Etobicoke North. Speaker, the Ontario's, uh, Ontario's provincial nominee program was designed to nominate workers who address skill gaps that employers have identified. Last year, 86% of businesses benefited from their nominees, including increased revenues, new contracts, and new customers. Recognizing this program's success, the Feds recently increased our nomination targets from 1,300 nominees to 2,500. This, of course, is good news, but the changing federal immigration climate is precarious. Over the next few years, there will be implementation of the expression of interest model, which will radically change Ontario immigration. Speaker, my question is this. How will Bill 161 better configure our provincial nominee program so that we can bring in question? newcomers? Thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member again for his excellent question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the member is correct. Our provincial nominee program is making a difference in, for Ontario businesses that have highly, highly specific skills to fill. 
The member is also correct in stating that the federal government intends to make massive changes to the immigration system here in the province of Ontario and throughout the country. Mr. Speaker, Ontario cannot afford to be left behind. We need to take steps to ensure that we chart our own course here in the province of Ontario. And Bill 161, if passed, would position Ontario to be a full partner in immigration with the federal government, giving Ontario a framework in which to design, deliver and manage a larger selection of our programs in regards to immigration. The legislation would allow Ontario to have similar powers to that of the federal government helping protect our program against fraud and misuse. Ontario is committed to increasing economic immigration to meet the needs of our knowledge-based yes, economy. Sir. Mr. Speaker, this proposed legislation would ensure that Ontario has a structure, the structures and tools in Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> New question, the member from Simcoe Gray. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the uh, Premier. Premier, on uh, March 3rd, in a reference to uh, funding for the uh, cystic fibrosis drug uh, Coladico uh, for 12-year-old Maddie Banstool, you told this legislature, and I quote, we're going to push to expedite the process and that you will, quote, keep her and her family in the loop. In fact, when you and your health minister met with Maddie and her mom that morning, you uh, promised that you would provide them with bi-weekly updates to advise them as to what was happening concerning the negotiations with the company Vertex uh, and the uh, Pan-Canadian Pricing Alliance. Um, it's been over two and a half weeks now, Premier, and Maddie and her mom have heard absolutely nothing from you or your government. In fact, they haven't even got a response to the many emails that they've sent to you. Since you won't respond to Question. her on your own, like you promised, let me ask you publicly, what have you done to, quote, expedite the process? Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, the Minister of Health will uh, answer this to the specifics on the uh, supplementary. But I want the member opposite to know that as recently as yesterday, I asked my staff in my, more, my uh, um, daily uh, senior staff meeting, I asked yesterday whether uh, the Vanstone family had been kept in the loop and wanted to make sure that that communication was happening. So um, if it's not happening, then it will. But I just want the member opposite to know that I asked that question, and I am going to make sure that uh, they get the information that they need. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, I can assure you that uh, Beth Van Stone, uh, Maddie's mother, tells us that that communication is not happening, uh, Premier. Premier, 15 countries, including England, Scotland, Ireland, Wales, France, Germany, Italy, the Netherlands, Austria, Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and the United States, and even Greece, which has a 28 percent unemployment rate, have all found the necessary resources to cover the cost of Kaleidoco. <laughs> and they have agreements in place with Vertex Pharmaceuticals, the company that makes the drug. So I ask you again, how long is your government willing to let Maddie Vanstone and other children with cystic fibrosis suffer before you actually do something? How many more bake sales, dog walks, lemonade stands do the children of Beaton and Bradford have to do in order to keep their friend alive? Do we tell these children to continue, or can we finally say to them that your government Question. values Maddie's life and will help to save it? Thank you. Premier. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Minister of Health and Long-Term Care. Well, thank you, Speaker, and I'm pleased to tell the member opposite that uh, a member of my staff actually has already spoken with, uh, with Maddie's mom earlier today, so we are committed to having that ongoing communication. Speaker, I was interested to, uh, to read an article written by Andre Picard in the Globe and Mail recently. And he, and he talked uh, with some thoughtfulness about the process of negotiating prices with drug companies. I, I have to say we are continuing that work. I've spoken to the Minister of Health in Alberta. Uh, we are uh, asking Vertex, the, the manufacturer based in the United States, to actually engage in negotiation with us. They have rejected proposals that are fair proposals. Speaker, we will continue to fight. But we, if the member opposite is suggesting that we pay whatever price those pharmaceutical companies ask us to pay, I have to say I completely disagree with him, and indeed he disagrees with himself because when he was health minister, he was in the very position that I am in now. Sir, thank you. Your question, the member from Parkdale High Park. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Finance. Uh, Minister, according to data provided by MPAC on 240 houses in an area in and around Parkdale High Park, 
property assessments for modest homes where typical middle-class families live are being overassessed. For example, a house on Campbell Avenue sold for $377,000, while M. Okay, member, was that's enough. For $537,000, it was assessed 42.9% over market value. This is another example of how this government is hitting middle-class families with taxes and fees. We've seen evidence in Parkdale High Park, Mr. Speaker. I asked the minister, is this a case throughout all of Ontario? Minister Finance. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. We are very cognizant of uh, the requirement to support and our middle class and ensure that people, especially those that are finding it tough, to afford to do the things that matter for their families. We also know that MPAC, which is an arm's length organization, which also includes uh, working with the municipalities by way of making those assessments with regards to the mill rate, um, is affecting communities all over the province. Now, as a result of the good work by my parliamentary assistant, Stephen Del Duca, we have reviewed MPAC and continue to do what's necessary to revise the, the, the processes to ensure fairness across the system, and we'll do just that. Thank you. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, the simple fact is it's not working. In just one small area of my riding, 20 modest homes were overassessed. at least 240 homes throughout the area generally. Why is the Liberal government hitting middle-class families with unfair over-assessments? It's going on. It continues to go on now. Thank you. Thank you, Minister. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not a fair comment, then, and I, I reject the premise, because there is an appeal process. Uh, the, 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 the householders can, can go forward and try to find ways to revise the, uh, their assessment, and that occurs all the time. And the member opposite knows that full well, so stop playing politics and help your constituents with the appeal. Yeah. Thank you for the question. The member from Glengarry Prescott Russell. Well, thank you very much, Speaker. Merci, merci, Monsieur le Président. My question is to Merci, Monsieur le Président. Trade and employment. Speaker, our government's economic plan uh, has produced solid job numbers, and in February alone, we gained 6,100 new jobs, wow. building on the 6,000 gained the month before. So our job plan is working, Mr. Speaker. Employment across the province is up by over 44, 440,000 jobs wow. from the recessionary low of 2009. And uh, just last year, employment rose by 95,000 jobs. And, Speaker, our government has made some tremendous strides throughout the province because of our, because of our successful, successful regional economic development funds. And these investments, Speaker, have actually impacted positively in my riding. Uh, yesterday, I had the privilege, Speaker, of hosting a Glengarry Prescott Russell Day here at Queen's Park. And uh, my constituents and my community leaders uh, who were here uh, know that there's a lot of economic Question. growth happening across the province. So, Speaker, I'm just going to ask the minister if he could update the House on uh, how we're creating jobs and partnering with Thank businesses you. to grow the economy. Excellent. Of economic Development, Trade and Employment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell for that great question. And I enjoyed, as I know many of the members from uh, both sides of the legislature enjoyed the Glengarry Prescott Russell Day yesterday. Thank you to the member for helping to organize that with his community. And uh, the member's riding, uh, like many ridings in eastern Ontario, has benefited significantly from our Eastern Ontario Development Fund. And just last week on Friday, I spent the whole day in the member's riding, and it was a wonderful opportunity to meet with many members of the community including the business uh, community and business leaders. And we announced three investments from the Eastern Ontario Development Fund, the one in Moulur, Alexandria Moulding, creating and retaining 353 jobs there at Montebello Packaging as well. Our investment there is helping the company create and retain 86 jobs. And Scott Adakis Goat Farm, uh, we've partnered yes, with this food processor to create and retain 110 jobs. Great companies in a great riding in a great province, Mr. Thank you. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you, Minister, uh, for your commitment on uh, job creation across the province of Ontario. I'm excited by the news of these significant investments in my riding, and I know that our government is working to spur growth through st strategic partnerships with businesses. In addition to regional economic development, I know that this government has partnered and invested in other major companies as part of our plan for the long-term economic growth. I'm aware of the major Cisco investment that created and retained 3,700 jobs, which is also the single largest tech 
tech investment in our province's history. We also had a significant investment in Ford Canada and Oakville and secured 2,800 jobs. This is great news for all Ontarians to take pride in, and our government has created the conditions for businesses to thrive and invest. Speaker, last week a significant announcement uh, an investment was made in jobs and in the people of my riding of Glengarry Prescott Russell. So, Minister, Question. please provide this House with an update on that specific announcement. Thank you, Minister. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and again, thank you to the member for his question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, the Strategic Jobs and Investment Fund targets specifically it's targeted to attract strategic investments in innovative projects that will create high-value added jobs and support cluster development. And we announced one, an important one, last week in the members' riding at Ivaco Rolling Mills in Lorignal. This investment will help the company modernize their facility. It's part of the steel sector, Mr. Speaker, and it will increase their capacity to produce high-quality steel products. It's also going to make the plant much more energy efficient, as well as reducing emissions and becoming a more sustainable operation. This is all good news for the community and the region. Our investment, Mr. Speaker, helped to create and sustain 450 jobs at that important lo location. The irony about this, Mr. Speaker, is that the official opposition, the party opposite, Answer. does not only oppose the southwestern and eastern development funds that result in good-paying jobs, but they continue to talk down business and investment in this country. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Energy. Minister, on Friday, March the 7th, it was announced that the Stone Boat Community Wind Farm would be with would be withdrawing its proposal to engage in a renewable energy project in my riding. While this developer made the right decision in withdrawing this project, I have been unable to get an answer from your ministry or the Ontario Power Authority about whether the FIT contract has also been cancelled. Oh, it's like playing a game of whack-a-mole. Where will this show up again? It's a moving target. So, Since your ministry will not respond to my questions from my office or requests from the community, I'm asking you directly today. Has this FIT project been cancelled by the Ministry of Energy? Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, the member will know that uh, our position is that we will not cancel existing contracts. That's very, very clear. The uh, party opposite, Mr. Speaker, has uh, flip-flopped on this, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, somebody on that side should work in the shoe store, Mr. Speaker, because they're uh -oh. experts on flip-flops. Flip the latest flip-flop is the Million Jobs Act, Mr. Speaker, whereby they give the Minister of Energy the uh, power to cancel existing contracts. That will expose us to litigation of $20 billion, Mr. Speaker. With respect to this particular uh, contract and the other contracts uh, in the area, the people who are proponents will have to meet all the conditions, including environmental conditions, exactly. and if they can't, they will fall by the wayside. Exactly. We have one that has fallen by the wayside, yes, and we sir. have to wait for the others to see whether they will be successful Patience. in the environmental assessment process. You know that I met with the, with the, uh, with the Buddhist uh, yes, proponents, Ed Scott uh, and uh, we, are, we are very, very set. <clears throat> Thank you. Supplementary. Uh, well, Minister, you did meet with them, and you said you wouldn't make any approvals till you contact them, and then you made an approval without letting them know in December, the last day of the legislature. Right. On March, you, know, you know, you keep saying that it's going to be legal to cancel feed-in contracts with wind power developers, but on March 4th, uh, I know that Wind Concerns Ontario released a letter to you referencing the decision in Trillium versus Ontario 2013, which clearly states that governments are free to alter policies in the public interest. The $40 million Sham Sham Temple Buddhist retreat near Bethany is in jeopardy because of the noise that these wind turbines will produce. The Peterborough Airport and its flight schools are worried about safety because of the sighting of a turbine in, uh, in a flight landing path. The City of Peterborough, the County of Peterborough, the the City of Port the Lakes, they've all said they don't want these wind turbines in their communities. Manvers Wind Concern, thousands of communities said that. You keep extending these contracts. You do have the out. So, Minister, why won't you listen to all these people in the Thank public you. interest and cancel Thank all you. those contracts? You see it, please? You see it, please? Thank you. Minister of the Environment. Speaker, uh, Take it easy, Otter Jim. Whenever one, whenever, whenever there is a, uh, whenever there's a uh, review of these, it's a very extensive review. 
which is conducted. A number of ministries make comments to the uh, Ministry of the Environment. The Please Ministry of the Environment has its now. officials conducting a review. There are onerous uh, requirements on the Order. part of uh, the proponent uh, to meet. There's even consultation in some cases where there's federal jurisdiction, uh, when we talk about NAV Canada, NAV Canada as being one of them. So there is all kinds of, all kinds of consultation in place. And Last ultimately, charge. in any of these cases, uh, when uh, any individual or group is dissatisfied with the decision that is rendered, that decision can go to a environmental yes, review tribunal. Sometimes these even end up in court. But I want to assure the member there's always a very extensive review of thank all of these. New question. Leader of the third party. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. During the recent by-election, the Premier announced in February that the Fort Erie racetrack would stay open. In the meantime, the racetrack submitted a detailed business plan to the government in February. The deadline to pay their lease is April 1st, less than two weeks away, and the track has no details as to whether the festival idea has been approved. They've received no money and no response from this government. Will the Premier keep her word and respond immediately to the Fort Erie business plan? and ensure that the track has the funding that they need to operate. Thank you, Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I know that the leader of the uh, third party will be very pleased to know that there's a meeting happening next week to finalize an agreement to make sure that there's a robust uh, season for Fort Erie. And, Mr. Speaker, I, uh, I know that she will pass that along to any of the people who are concerned. We're committed. We're committed to having that season at Fort Erie, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'm glad that the meeting's going to happen next week. Thank you. Well, Speaker, I'm talking more than just a season. I'm talking about a future for the racetrack at Fort Erie. For almost two years, this government flip-flopped on the Fort Erie racetrack. They don't seem to understand that businesses need stability to operate. Asking the track for a business plan and then not responding when the deadline to shut the doors is looming is just not acceptable. There are a thousand jobs at stake in Fort Erie. Will the Premier ensure that the Fort Erie racetrack stays is open by providing the funding and long-term commitment that they need for more than just one season, but for a future of another hundred years at that track. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I'm talking about a five-year plan, Mr. Speaker. I'm talking about $400 million that we are putting into the horse racing industry to make sure that we have those long-term plans, Mr. Speaker. But the reality is that all of the tracks are going to have to work to make sure that there are business plans in place, Mr. Speaker. These are business Businesses. We've, we took out a, an unaccountable, not a, a, a non-transparent program, Mr. Speaker, and we're putting in place a transparent process. We're investing in the horse racing industry to make sure that the tracks around the province, including Fort Erie, can be sustainable, Mr. Speaker. So I'm glad the meeting's happening next week. One of the issues has been whether there would be a 2014 season. There will be a 2014 season. My hope is that we'll be able to have that long-term plan, Mr. Speaker, and I look forward to seeing the results of the discussion. Good question, the member from Scarborough Gilbert. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Minister, just last week you made an important funding announcement with the Canadian Sport Institute Ontario, CSIO, and a couple of our wonderful Olympic athletes at the University of Toronto. This is great news for my riding of Scarborough Guildwood as the CSIO will be housed at the University of Toronto Scarborough campus. As a legacy piece, the Pan Am Aquatic Centre and Fieldhouse will be a beautiful facility that's going to be used by the community and by our athletes for decades to come after the Games are over. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can he please explain how this funding will benefit Ontario's athletes? Thank you, Minister Tourism, Culture and Sport. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you much for the question. And I want to thank the member from Scarborough Gilwood for the question. Speaker, the funding for CSIO is $8 million over three years Excellent. that will purchase specialized equipment, enhance and expand the current Ontario High Performance Sport Initiative program, open a new facility, and offer programs and services, and also increase space funding to support those operating and programming costs. Speaker, our government recognizes the importance of supporting our high-performance athletes and coaches. Yeah. The 2015 Pan Parapan American Games only heightens our shared interest in that sport. Speaker, 
This is why we are committed to working closely with CSIO. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. We can all agree that it's extremely important to support our high-performance athletes and the coaches and organizations that train them. I know this firsthand because my brother has benefited from a successful career in professional sports. During your announcement, you also mentioned funding for two other programs from your ministry. One of them you mentioned a couple weeks ago, Quest for Gold which undoubtedly has proven successful given the recent results from our amazing Ontarians competing at the Olympics in Sochi. The other being the Sport Hosting Fund, which will help deliver great sporting events to our province like the upcoming 2014 FIFA Under-20 Women's World Cup. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, again, through you to the Minister, could he provide us with the details of this funding? Question. Thank you, Minister. Mr. Speaker, our government is proud to continue our commitment to our high-performance athletes and para-athletes. For 2013 to 14, my ministry is providing a whopping 10 million from the Crest to Go program for a number of them who just returned from Sochi. Speaker, in addition to that, the announcement last week also includes 2 million for our sport hosting fund from Celebrate Ontario, which will help host events like the upcoming 2014 World Junior Girls Golf Championship. Yeah. Speaker, since 2006, we launched Ontario's international amateur sport hosting policy. Our government has provided over $1 million to support 34 events. These investments encourage athletes and national sport organizations to consider Ontario as the province Thank of you. choice to train and compete. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The member from Holton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, to the Minister of Finance, Ontario's colleges find themselves waiting once again to hear when your government will address the serious backlog of deferred maintenance issues at the province's existing buildings. This is a serious issue for every one of the colleges throughout the province and is also a long-standing problem. In 2010, the Auditor General said the deferred maintenance backlog is in the range of half to three-quarters of a billion dollars. Most significantly, the Auditor General said that about $70 million of these maintenance and repairs are in the critical category. Minister, this involves safety. Ontario's colleges need to ensure that students are learning in a safe and effective environment. Can you assure us, Minister, that your 2014 Question. budget will finally address this critical issue? Thank you. Minister Finance. Minister of Training Colleges and Universities, Mr. Speaker. Minister of Training Colleges and Universities. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I got to tell you, I am astounded by that question coming from the party opposite, a party that cut and slashed our, our colleges and universities through their entire time in office. We, on the other hand, in stark contrast to their approach, have put in place billions of dollars, records amounts of investment in capital projects for colleges and universities across this province. In the next two years alone, there's, there's $800 million to be spent in capital investments in our colleges and universities. Mr. Speaker, that's record amounts of funding. Now, deferred maintenance is an issue, and Mr. Speaker, we're working hard with the sector to address it, but coming from the party opposite, that question Answer. is almost laughable. Back to the Minister of Finance. Last time I checked, the Minister of Colleges and Universities doesn't know what's in the budget. Last time I checked, it's up to the Minister of Finance to, to do the budget of this province. Aside from what he said, it was the Auditor General that I'm quoting and his, revo his report from 2010. And, he, and the, uh, the Minister of the Day agreed with the Auditor. They agreed with the Auditor and yet Francisco nothing North has been done. Order. Four years and nothing has been done. Minister, it isn't good enough to simply invest in new buildings. We must ensure that our existing colleges and their many campuses are effectively maintained, and our students deserve nothing less, nothing less than to learn in a safe environment. You stand in your place today and give our colleges a commitment 
that your 14 budget will finally and seriously address these much needed, much needed repairs. Thank you. Thank you. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Minister. Speaker. We'll continue to address the capital challenges in our post-secondary sector, but let me tell you what our students deserve. They deserve, and they're getting, a government that stands up for them when it comes to affordability. Our 30 per cent off tuition program is funding 230,000 low- and middle-income students. That's a program that your party wants to cut and eliminate. 230,000 low- and middle-income students would have to find more, more dollars, $1,700 more a year, to be able to fund their education. We're going to keep standing up for students. We're going to keep investing in our post-secondary insti institutions. Unlike you did, we'll never leave them in the lurch that you left them in 10 years ago. Thank you. New question. The member from Wallen. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Natural Resources. Today, I rise to echo concern. Sorry. Excuse me. Stop the clock. The member from Oakville will withdraw. Thank you. Echo concerns of my constituents as well as elected officials throughout the Niagara region. As the minister knows, conservation authorities have an important job preserving and protecting our land and waterways for Ontarians. Recently, the actions of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority have raised concerns. Their strategic plan shows a shift toward land acquisition, disposal, and development. And my constituents and elected officials are telling me that property development seems more important than conservation by the NPCA. Does the minister share the concerns of the people of Welland and Niagara about this direction? Thank you. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to respond. And, uh, Speaker, I've received a letter today from the uh, member from Welland, so I'm happy to uh, review that and uh, get back to uh, the member. But with respect to uh, conservation authorities, what I am pleased to report is that since 2003, our government's provided over $130 million to 36 different conservation authorities across the province, and this year we're going to be providing $12 million as well. Uh, with respect to the governance of conservation authorities, the Conservation Authorities Act 1946 established Establishes these uh, organizations. And the responsibility and makeup of conservation authorities, as the member knows, is directed largely by elected representatives of municipalities. Uh, in fact, the board of directors, they're responsible for uh, making all staffing and hiring decisions with respect to the general manager and the yes, chief sir. administrative officer of the conservation authorities. I'll have more to say in the supplementary, Speaker. Thank you, supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. I urge the minister to look into this matter. Just yesterday, the NPCA purchased a piece of land in Waynefleet with regional taxpayer dollars that was rejected and deemed unsuitable by the Niagara Regional Council in 2012. The purchase of that land was conditional on Waynefleet cutting a developer a break and waiving the township's 5% in lieu of parkland uh, deal thousands of dollars for that municipality, thousands of taxpayer dollars from the region. Our conservation authority needs to be focused on keeping water clean, preventing floods, keeping our residents safe from natural hazards, not cutting deals for developers. To the minister again, is he prepared to conduct a review or an audit of the Niagara Peninsula Conservation Authority to ensure it's meeting its mandate? Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Uh, and to the member, with respect to uh, the accountability of conservation uh, uh, authorities across the province, uh, you know, they are audited uh, regularly. The funding that we do provide, uh, they are accountable for. Uh, the large majority of members on conservation authority boards are elected representatives from municipalities, and uh, perhaps some of these questions would be best directed uh, to those municipalities in the regional areas. The reality is that those individuals that are on these boards are accountable to their uh, municipal colleagues who are elected representatives as well. I'm happy to review this, happy to look into this, but those are uh, independent boards and agencies that uh, are responsible for the decisions that they make and are accountable to their local electorate. I, uh I have received uh, a uh, appropriate uh, point of privilege, and I'm prepared to hear that now. I will call upon the uh, government house leader to make his presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, as you just noted, I rise on a, uh, uh, a point of privilege, which uh, 
is in regard to question period on Tuesday, March 18, 2014. At that time, the member from Nipissing uh, disclosed the contents of a confidential committee document. This disclosure, Mr. Speaker, I would submit was a flagrant an intentional breach of a November 26, 2013 motion of the Standing Committee on Estimates, which required that certain commercially sensitive and privileged documents be kept confidential. The release, in confidential committee, the release of confidential committee documents to the public without authorization from the committee, I believe, Mr. Speaker, represents a serious breach and must attract strong sanction to defer future breaches. Now, to go through the facts, Mr. Speaker, giving rise to contempt, I begin with the statement in question period by the member. He made the following statement in a question to the Minister of Finance, and I quote, we also saw that you blacked out many emails labeling them commercially sensitive information. Well, let's take a look at what you're covering over. And he quotes from the document, no funding for incremental compensation increases for new collective agreements, salaries for designated groups frozen until 2007-18. This disclosure was done, Mr. Speaker, with full knowledge that the information was intended to remain confidential and despite the clear direction from the Estimates Committee that the information not be made public. And I'd like to spend a few uh, minutes on the Estimates Committee and the direction they gave. Now, first of all, the statement read by Mr. Fidelli was contained in a document that was disclosed by the Ministry of Finance in response to the following June 11, 2013 motion of the Estimates Committee, and I quote, I move that the Standing Committee on Estimates request from the Ministry of Finance, Cabinet Office and Office of the Budget and Treasury Board the following documentation. All fiscal journals produced for Treasury Board Management Board of Cabinet between April 1, 2013 and June 11, 2013, medium and long-term expense outlooks containing fiscal years 2015-16, 2016-17 and 2017-18. Any document stated 2013 containing consideration of user fees and or revenue generating fees, taxes or tolls, all fiscal and economic update presentations and or slide decks provided to Cabinet. On October 15, 2013, the Ministry of Finance provided the Committee with an unprecedented number of privileged and commercially sensitive documents that were responsive to this motion. In light of the sensitive nature of the disclosure, the Ministry provided two sets of documents to the Committee. One set was redacted for privileged and commercially sensitive information, and one set contained unredacted copies of the documents which were not to be made public. On November 26, 2013, the Committee passed a motion which required unredacted documents to be kept confidential and the Committee to notify the Ministry of Finance in advance should the Committee decide to make the unredacted documents public. And I quote again, your subcommittee, and I quote from the decision of the Committee, your subcommittee on committee business met on Tuesday, October 29, 2013, and Thursday, November 7, 2013, to consider the method of proceeding with the information received from the Ministry of Finance pursuant to the June 11, 2013 motion adopted in Committee during review of the 2013-14 estimates of the Ministry of Finance and recommends the following. One, that the committee accepts the information received from the Ministry of Finance that are responsive to parts one, two, and four of the motion. Two, that one electronic copy of all redacted and unredacted documents received be provided to each caucus and that the caucuses keep the unredacted documents confidential. Three, that the Ministry of Finance be notified in advance should the committee decide to make the unredacted documents public. Four, that the redacted documents responsive to part two of the motion be made public. And five, that the subcommittee meet when the information responsive to part three of the motion is received by the committee. Now, Mr. Speaker, disclosure of confidential committee information is a breach of privilege. On May 20, 2010, the Speaker commented on the nature of confidenti confidentiality in committee, stating, and I quote, a parliamentary committee is a creature of this House, subservient to the instructions of this House and able to report only to this House. An unauthorized or premature release of a committee report or in-camera proceeding has indeed been found on certain occasions in the Legislature and others to be a prima facie breach of the privileges of the Legislature. 
Release of commercially sensitive information is serious. It puts negotiations at risk, it creates an unstable business environment, and it undermines the trust of third parties whose records we disclose. Now, Mr. Speaker, the question has been raised, why are we raising this in the House and not the committee? As members may be aware, Estimates Committee is not currently sitting pursuant to Standing Order 63A of the, of the Standing Orders. This statement in question, Mr. Speaker, I would also remind members, was made in the House and therefore I contend should be dealt with in the House. Now, Mr. Speaker, there were questions raised in question period this morning of whether an unredacted version of this document exists and whether this uh, is a cure for contempt. And although, as I say, Mr. Speaker, that question may be out there of whether there is an unredacted separate document, it is clear from the member's own statement that he knew that the information was intended to be kept confidential. It was a clearly redacted in the copy that the it was clearly redacted, Mr. Speaker, in the copy that the member read to us. It is clear that the information was intended to be confidential to the committee and that the member was aware. The member from Nipissing, I remind you, Mr. Speaker, specifically noted that the information he read had been blacked out. He specifically stated that information had been blacked out on the basis of commercial sensitivity. Before quoting directly from the redacted portion of the document, the member from Nipissing said, and again I quote, let's take a look at what you were covering over, close quote. If there was any uncertainty about whether the information was confidential and how it should have been dealt with, I think the member should have taken the matter to the committee. Now, due to the large number of documents disclosed, it is possible that human error may occur and information that was intended to be redacted is not in one or more documents. This was specifically noted, Mr. Speaker, by the Deputy Minister of Finance in his cover letter, which accompanied the Ministry's production in response to this motion, and I quote, Please note that every effort has been made, including the retention of an outside law firm specializing on document disclosure to identify commercially sensitive information. However, given the volume and scope of material being included and the time period to produce these records, the ministry cannot guarantee that all commercially sensitive information has been redacted. Now, Mr. Speaker, another point that has been raised is about the time of me raising this. I would argue that this issue was raised at the first opportunity. It did take a bit of time, Mr. Speaker, due to the voluminous number of records provided by the Ministry of Finance in response to the committee's request for information. Time was needed to review the records and identify the information referred to by the member. So, Mr. Speaker, I just want to summarize. Uh, we are a, a government which has prided itself on our openness. We have uh, put forward millions of records across a number of committees. But, Mr. Speaker, what we are talking about today, Mr. Order. Speaker, is that the member from Nipissing improperly re re released documents that the committee, including members from his own caucus, deemed to be commercially sensitive. Mr. Speaker, the committee was. Member from the PN Carlton will come to order. Mr. Speaker, the committee was unanimous in voting to keep the and commercially Stormont. sensitive documents confidential. They did this because releasing them could negatively impact our business environment and job creation or hurt taxpayers. Mr. Speaker, we released thousands of documents intending them to make them public, but that doesn't apply to those documents that could hurt private commercial interests or taxpayers. And the fact of the matter is, Mr. Speaker, if the honourable member had any questions about those documents, he had uh, every right to go back to refer to the committee motion, which made it very clear that they should be kept confidential unless the committee decided out elsewhere. So, Mr. Speaker, I therefore move that the matter of the Speaker's finding of a uh, prima facie case of privilege with respect to the disclosure of confidential information by the uh, member for Nipissing, or that you hear the matter, and uh, uh, I will uh, obviously. Sorry, I won't go there, Mr. Speaker. I ask, Mr. Speaker, for you to refer the matter, and of course, uh, uh, if you were to rule in the positive, I'd be in a position to uh, refer to a specific committee. Before I, uh, before I uh, seek response, um, first of all, thank you for withdrawing that motion was, would not be appropriate, um, and I thank the member for his uh, submission. And I was going to say right up until the last second, thank you to all the members for their uh, important and uh, collegial response to this serious issue, and I would uh, expect it to continue. 
uh, and for those that started to stop. So now I'm prepared to hear another point of order on the same issue from the member from the uh, uh, opposition uh, house leader. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, first of all, I will be very brief because the honourable member from Nipissing, uh, Mr. Fideli, can uh, certainly speak for himself in this matter. Uh, nothing has uh, happened uh, that's in any way of breach of uh, the trust of the committee or the confidentiality of the committee. The documents, uh, as you'll clearly see, and I have the CD here, the redacted documents that uh, Mr. Fideli uh, made public uh, were in the public domain. The Honourable House Leader for the Government uh, said that uh, this afternoon in question period when he said, Mr. Speaker, I'm trying to get this clear. The Honourable Member is standing up and quoting from documents that were provided by the Ministry of Finance to the Committee, which are in the public domain, which are in the possession of all members of the Committee. And he's standing here in the legislature and saying that we did not give him the documents or give them the documents. So, um, secondly, just because he's mentioned the points, this is all contained in, in, in our submission uh, previously to you, Mr. Speaker. But we do question the fact that just because the Estimates Committee isn't sitting, uh, that they can't deal with this matter. Uh, they should be called back to deal with this matter as, as per our standing orders. Um, that's, you tried this trick during gas plants and said the committee wasn't sitting right at the very beginning when we brought the contempt motion forward, and, uh, and that didn't hold water then, and it shouldn't hold water in this case. Secondly, we do question, although it's a more minor point, I would agree with the Honourable House Leader, uh, the timeliness of this, uh, this uh, the beginning of this incident, a uh, so-called incident, uh, began quite a few days ago, and it's only now that they're bringing it forward. Having said that, Mr. Speaker, um, it is clear to anyone that the documents uh, that Mr. Fideli put forward came from either the CD or physically from the box that everybody in the committee room knew were the public documents. Now, you guys messed up by setting four different versions of one document. You redacted, as Mr. Fideli will show you, two lines of four lines in one document. You didn't redact anything in another document. You redact a different line in a third document. This is all the same page, just four different times. Shows your government you can't even do a cover up properly. That, uh, excuse me. Order, please. Order, please. Order, please. The uh, the member will withdraw. <laughs> withdraw, Mr. Speaker. And then there's 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 another copy of fourth copy of the document where a, a different two other lines are redacted. So, um, it, you know, it, this is a this is a smear campaign. It is it is below the uh, respectability that I have respect I have for the government house leader on many other matters. Uh, he is the person that's supposed to be in charge of the open government uh, project that this government apparently is going forward on. Um, the fact that he would do this to my colleague is shameful, and you're just simply trying to distract the public from the fact that Mr. Fideli is a better finance minister than your finance minister will ever be, and that he, through diligent work of thousands of documents, has found that you uh, excuse, excuse me. I, I'm, uh, I'm trying to be as lenient as possible, but I'm also going to ask you to stay directed to the specific uh, of this uh, uh, issue, please. Thank you. Well, I get a little emotional, Mr. Speaker, when they do pull this nonsense to distract the public from the fact that they can't be honest with the public about the finances of this province. But having said that, Mr. Speaker, I've dealt with some of the technical arguments that the Honourable House Leader has brought forward, and I know Mr. Fideli would like the opportunity to make his presentation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, just says uh, from New Democrats as the House Leader, I, I want to make a couple of points here. First of all, 
The, the, uh, the Honourable uh, House Leader for the Government uh, said the Estimates Committee is not sitting. That is not the case. The Estimates Committee actually did sit, sit two weeks ago. They are still able to meet because there are some procedural matters that they still have to deal with, so I think you should correct his record. In fact, Estimates is still in session, and this could have been brought to Estimates. Uh, the second thing that I would say, and I, I understand the government's concern in regards to them feeling sensitive at this particular time within their mandate, they're feeling a little bit, how would you say, uh, under pressure, uh, considering uh, what's going on politically in this province, and I understand their want to be able to try to do this. But I got I to gotta say, say the following. We have seen an unprecedented number—the government is right. We have seen an unprecedented number of documents that have been released to various committees of this assembly. That is true. But we would also have seen that the government at numerous times tried to say that certain governments were sensitive, tried to make them private and confidential in camera with the committee, but when then committee members looked at the documents, they weren't commercially sensitive. They were politically embarrassing. That was the difference. So the government in this particular case is making the argument that the, you know, these were documents that were uh, commercially sensitive. All I'm saying for the record, Mr. Speaker, there has been lots of examples in committee over the last two and a half years where documents were attempted by the government to be, made to be in camera so that they not be released, supposedly because they're commercially sensitive, where in fact they were not. So I would just say to the government and to, the, uh, to your deliberation on that in order to keep that in, into account. I understand what the government house, re, house leader arises, but I think the point has also been made that the same document exists both in, in the commercially in the in the okay just to make it clear documents are given to the committee and then the committee has to vote if those documents are made public the same documents as i understand that are being referred to that are supposedly the ones that are in camera that can't be released they're actually in the public documents as well so i think you need to look at both of those when you're making your decision about is this in fact a case of contempt thank you the member from Nipissing. thank you speaker Thank you, Speaker. Uh, I wanted to take this opportunity to respond to the minister's point of privilege that he sent to you uh, on March 19, 2014. The point of privilege revolves around his accu uh, accusation that I released confidential documents from the Standing Committee on Estimates. As you read in the minister's submission, the Standing Committee on Estimates requested the documents on June 11, 2013 from the Ministry of Finance. Once the documents were received by the committee, the committee passed a motion that said, quote, one electronic copy of all redacted and unredacted documents received be provided to each caucus. It goes on to say that unredacted documents were to remain confidential and redacted documents were to be made public, period. I draw to your attention subsection 4 of the November 26 motion, which states, and I quote, that the redacted documents responsive to part 2 of the motion be made public, period, quote. May I have the disc? <clears throat> Speaker, this is precisely and only where the information I released was sourced from the redacted files which were already made public. The disk here has two sides, confidential and confidential unredacted and redacted. Part two is the area and only the area which I drew from. This is why Mr. Malloy, the minister, is categorically false in his assertion yeah, 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 yeah. that I was releasing confidential information from an unredacted document. I did no such thing. I only released information that the committee had already released uh, into the public domain. Again, only from that file. I have attached in my letter to you, Speaker, uh, four different print screens to my written submission. And I will ask that you'll notice at the top left hand of each of these screen captures, it says redacted box, 
redacted box, redacted box, redacted box. And again, the redacted documents uh, of part two be made public. So again, I'm only dealing with public documents. Um, you will notice also that uh, they tell you what box they're from, box one, box four, and box seven. All of that is included on the disc. You will also note that I have included the page number uh, for you to see, page 373 of page 2,970, page 2,736 out of 3,171, page 2,849 out of, pay, out of uh, possible 3,179, and page 2,185 out of 2,303 pages. Again, uh, all of that is uh, attached in my document. In each of these public domain redacted documents, which were per the committee's uh, November 26 motion, you will clearly see that the quote cited by the minister in his submission is redacted in two of the attached documents, uh, but not redacted in box four or box seven. Therefore, they are accessible in the public domain. Again, if I may uh, repeat what the uh, House Leader of the Third Party said, there's nothing commercially sensitive about these speakers. They're just politically explosive. So let me uh, illustrate again. In one of the versions of the document, on the redacted, which are public domain, somebody has redacted three different paragraphs. In another version of it, somewhere else in the document, somebody has redacted the first and last, but not all the ones in the middle. In another version, somebody redacted the second and the last, not the first in the middle. But this person here just left it all unredacted. This is the document that I am going from. This is in the redacted file, totally in the public domain, that anybody in the media who takes the disc can access just as easily as I did. Speaker, that's the evidence that I have specifically to the documents and where I source them, only sourced from public domain documents that the committee has already released. Now, Speaker, I would like to draw your attention to the general rule regarding point of privileges stemming from the matters in the committee. Mr. Malloy's issue is strictly related to the release of documents that were confidential to the committee. In fact, all of Mr. Malloy's references and pre uh, precedents relate to the committee. However, O'Brien and Bosk are categorical when discussing the proper procedures about matters of privilege related to committee. They state that, quote, speakers have consistently ruled that, except in the most extreme situations, they will only hear questions of privilege arising from a committee proceedings upon presentations of a report from the committee, which directly deals with the matter and not as a question of privilege raised by an individual member. They also point to a ruling from former House of Commons Speaker Peter Milliken concerning the disclosure of confidential draft committee report. In that case, Speaker Milliken ruled that, quote, in the absence of a report from the committee on such an issue, it is virtually impossible for the chair to make any judgment as to the prima facie occurrence of a breach of privilege with regard to such charges. Therefore, the issue should not have even come to the floor of this legislature because the government House Leader has ignored parliamentary tradition and procedure by failing to raise the issue at the Standing Committee on Estimates. Lastly, I take issue with the timeliness of Mr. Malloy's point of privilege. Parliamentary authorities state that, quote, a member must satisfy the Speaker that he or she is bringing the matter to the attention of the House as soon as practicable after becoming aware of the situation. When a member has not fulfilled this important requirement, the Speaker has ruled that the matter is not a prima facie question of, priv of uh, privilege. By the time Mr. Malloy will have raised the issue in the House, it will have been over 48 hours since I asked the question that has raised their ire. In fact, the government House Leader and his staff had ample opportunity to review the instant answer, check the documents, because they are searchable. Uh, all of his staff, uh, all his staff had to do was copy my quote and search the different files. They would have found them in the files that are already disclosed in the public domain. Speaker, there's no reason why Mr. Malloy needed 30 hours to bring their point of privilege to your attention. On any points of privilege brought forward by the Ontario PC Caucus, we have given notice expeditiously and introduced them on the next sessional day. Mr. Malloy had time to introduce his point of privilege yesterday, but he waited and did not introduce the point of privilege at his earliest possible uh, opportunity. I ask that you find the government House Leader has not fulfilled the requirement and rule against this point of privilege. In conclusion, Speaker, I must say, and this is not the first time, I find it deplorable that the government House Leader has brought this frivolous, 
point of privilege forward to distract from the context of the documents. It is an attempt to damage my good standing as an MPP and my reputation. As you can see, I only released redacted documents that were in the public domain already. I followed the committee's instructions and have not released any documents that were marked as confidential. Thank you, Speaker. I listened uh, carefully uh, to the. Uh, are you? Uh, well, you have to indicate that. Point of order on the same issue. The member from Cambridge. Mr. Speaker, I'm not going to take too much more time on this particular issue, but I do want to draw attention to a few things. Uh, and at the outset, I want to state uncategorically that the member for Nipissing is a champion for truth <clears throat> for the people of the province of Ontario. I wanted this legislature and you, Mr. Speaker, to take into account what has transpired with that committee. As has been noted in the government's submission that the initial request for documentation came on June 11th of 2013 through a motion. That motion wasn't fully complied with until just a few weeks ago, Mr. Speaker. And I think that's important to note because we have been going through this process for nearly, more, for nearly a year in trying to extract the documents and to release the documents in an appropriate manner, and there was agreement on the approach that we were taking to do that. And I state that, Mr. Speaker, because it st speaks to the fact that there was ample time to actually go through and vet all those documents. It's taken almost 10 months to get them fully out to the, in the public domain already. There shouldn't be the kinds of inconsistencies that have been very evident in the process of disclosure of this document. So I want to state, Mr. Speaker, that we have to understand that this is a very sensitive file. I understand that there are uh, certain reasons why some documents need to be redacted. We have complied with that. We have followed those, those, those reasons, and we've respected the wishes of the government to keep those unredacted documents confidential. We have respected that. We have complied with it in due course. And I also want to mention, Mr. Speaker, that during the course of committee, we learned that the government has, and the public service has gone through a process for document disclosure on the basis of all the documents that we've requested in this committee, er, in this legislature, in this committee, in the various committees of this legislature. They are now contracting an outside firm, law firm, to go through and vet all these documents. That's what they're doing. Uh, and in the process of doing that, they're, they're obviously, in the process of getting those things vetted, they're trying to standardize their approach for document disclosure and document release. And that's something that we are fully expected to comply with. So if there is an issue that a document was unredacted, that should have been redacted, or vice versa, the responsibility rests for the, the people who are doing the redactions, not for the member from Nipissing. And so I want you to be, be very clear, Mr. Speaker, that if there is an issue here with documents that weren't completely redacted, the government should take that up with the contracted firm that did the redactions in the first place, not from the member of Nipissing, who is doing his job to uncover the truth for the people of Ontario. The motion was very clear. It stated that all redacted documents be made public. The documents that were released by the member from Nipissing came from boxes that were clearly labeled redacted. If there was some mistake, it is not the member of Nipissing's fault. It is the fault of the people who are doing the redactions. So this is a completely frivolous matter, Mr. Speaker. They should be taking this matter up with the people who were doing this uh, process. So Mr. Speaker, in conclusion, we are dealing with only one thing here, and that is sometimes the truth really hurts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, uh, I have listened very carefully to all of the presentations. I thank all the members for their contributions and uh, seeing the importance of this particular issue. I'll reserve my ruling uh, for a later date, and I thank you all the members for your input. At this time, there are no deferred votes. This House will stand recess until 1 p.m. this afternoon.